Hello and welcome back, folks. Hopefully you're refreshed, hopefully you enjoyed your break, and hopefully you're ready to bite down on some more knowledge bombs. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Nava. Uh, she's here to talk to us about deploying chat GPT-like apps. And uh, I'm not going to waste any more of your time, Nava. Uh, it seems like you've got a big subject to cover, so why don't you take it away? Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. So, hi, everyone. I'm very excited to be here in Devos Pro Europe. My name is Nava Levy. I'm a technology evangelist for data science and machine learning operations, or MLOps, which is basically the domain that we apply DevOps to machine learning. I'm going to be talking about one of the most exciting uh, subjects today, I think, in AI, which is ChatGPT, and how can we replicate the magic of ChatGPT to our own use cases and organization. And, um, you know, ChatGPT uh, sparked a tremendous amount of developer innovation and creativity, but deploying, you know, those systems in production for our organization is not without challenges. So we'll talk about that and how embeddings and vector database can help address that. So generative, generative AI app like ChatGPT and specifically ChatGPT is taking the world by storm. In just two months, it's reached 100 million uh, users. And this is way more, you know, way faster than, in, than uh, Facebook or Twitter. Even TikTok, it took nine months. So, and this is because of its human-like ability to generate conversation, a dialogue, and it, it, it can be a brainstorming companion, a, a, a chat companion, but it can be much more than that. It, can, it even passed the bar, beating 90% of lawyers, and it is doing very well also in medicine and programming and other areas. And this is, you know, very exciting, but also slightly scary because it, it, it's, uh, you know, what does it mean to us and to you guys, right, to all of us? And the disruption uh, that we expected already arrived. For instance, check stock dropped 40% as students turned to ChatGPT. So on the one hand, uh, generative AI, you know, those AI that can generate content, not just text like ChatGPT, but also images and music and speech and code, um, will disrupt the job market. It will affect uh, you and me, but it's also a 300 billion dollar uh, it's too, sorry 100 billion dollar opportunity so millions of jobs are going to Im be impacted on the one hand but on the other hand it's a huge market opportunity so how can we be part of this uh, opportunity and one of uh, the ways we can do it is to create our own chat gpt like app for our own use cases and organization the problem is that you know creating a demo with the chat gpt like capabilities is uh, something that uh, it's relatively easy to do, maybe uh, you know, a few days, a hackathon, but deploying it in production is with not, not without uh, challenges. So even ChatGPT, OpenAI themselves say, you know, we have issues, limitations, be, be, beware, may occasionally generate incorrect information, produce harmful or biased content, limited knowledge, you know, it's pretty outdated. It's uh, until September, 2021. And BARD, Google's BARD, is no better. The system may occasionally generate incorrect or misleading information and produce offensive or biased content. Now, this isn't just the problem. It's a big, huge problem. But there are other challenges. How do I integrate my company's proprietary da data? So ChatGPT can bar pass the, the bar, but it doesn't know anything about my data, right? Because it wasn't trained on my data. So how can I apply to my proprietary data? and protect its security and privacy. How, in, how can I integrate fresher data, maybe from 2022, 2023, and real-time data? How can I secure the data, the privacy of the users? Why aren't the resources, references, when ChatGPT answered? So how can, I, how can I amend that? What about what I said, not just yesterday or a minute ago, but maybe a year ago, chat memory or long-term memory? Why doesn't he know what I said earlier? Inconsistent response. So the score or the grade of, let's say, an essay can vary from, you know, from, from one generation to another, but also the format. So it could give the score and then also the explanation. And, and so it's so a downstream application. This inconsistency is a problem. How to keep low cost? This is, this is true for all applications, but especially for those huge uh, models that you know cost a lot to train and to run. 
What about uptime and response speed? You know, the latency, the delay that we experience. And I think we all experience it with chat GPT. So uh, in this presentation, we will see how embeddings and vector databases that store those embeddings help address most of these challenges, not all of them, but a lot of these challenges. And um, so the, the first thing that uh, a vector database helps is with creating proprietary chat GPT, proprietary large language model. So generative AI is anything that generates uh, a content, maybe it's code or music or images or, or text like chat GPT. And when it generates text, we call it LLM or large language model. So vector database will be essential for organization building proprietary large language models. This is what the CEO of NVIDIA said in the last GTC, GPU tech conference, uh, just two months ago. And uh, we can see that by the, the, the investment of VCs, venture capitalists in startups. So this is for every half year. So in the first uh, half of 2022, $44 million were invested in startups. In the second half, $60 million. And in the first half of this year, okay, just think the past year, most companies cut costs, uh, laid off people, uh, vector data spaces. And just, you know, in the past few months, maybe four, four months, $169 million were raised for startups focusing on vector databases. So this is, includes neural search uh, frameworks like Gina AI and Re Relevance AI. Uh, just vector databases. Uh, and this is the chat GPT moment. You can see the huge spike from 60 million to 169 million. And the reason for it is that embeddings, what vector databases stores, okay, this we can see here an embedding. It's a basically an, a, a numerical representation of, of, a, of an object, a real life object. So this could be like an image of a cat, or this could be a sentence. So this embedding, which is a list of numbers, this is actually the language, the internal language or the native language of AI, of those large language models, those huge deep learning models, those foundation models. They speak or what they understand, how they represent the world is in embeddings. And it's not just their internal language. Also, when they talk to a downstream model, maybe a, a much smaller model, they pass on an embedding, okay? For them, it means it makes a lot of sense. So it's it makes sense that if this is what a, this AI use, this is also um, a, what uh, um, this this is the type of databases that they need. You know that that embeddings are, are addressed natively as first class citizens. So here we can see a large language model passing an embedding for a downstream task. Maybe it's sentiment analysis or translation or summarization, and it's the same vector. So. Let's say that uh, this vector represents an object, which is a paragraph. So one is a review. And for sentiment analysis, I would want to know if it's a positive or a negative. One is for translation, so maybe to translate from English to French. And another is to summarize this paragraph in one sentence. OK, so these are example of three downstream tasks. And today, the language, the large language models require less fine tuning and so maybe you want to fine tune it on your own specific data which will be different so vector embeddings are the native language of foundation models and deep learning models the ml models that underpin generative ai capabilities now here is another view of it so for each ai from before there is a sphere okay it's basically represent a model which has lots and lots of layers and uh, from each layer you pass that is made of neurons and um, you pass uh, embeddings the many many embeddings now you train the foundation model on a huge amount of data the data doesn't have to be just text a la large language model will be trained on text maybe a trillion uh, tokens okay it's huge it's like the whole internet maybe a billion images but it can also be speech and dna structure and and the uh, uh, music, what, whatever th that we want. Then we, we we train the model. It can cost anywhere between half a million to $20 million to train a foundation model. And once uh, this model is trained, the parameters are, are um, we have the parameters, the weights for the mathematical formula, which is the foundation model. We can use it to fine tune uh, to specific tasks 
all to specific uh, domains. We, we use embeddings to transfer the learning from the foundation model to our use cases. And here we don't have to invest half a million dollars or $20 million, and we don't have to use trillion tokens. It might be enough only um, um, just 1,000 or a few hundred samples. And this is, this is, this is what enables the democratization of, of uh, AI or deep learning. And uh, this, I hear there are different tasks, but also different domains, healthcare, finance, agriculture. So image recognition, uh, whether it's a cat or a dog, might be different whether um, um, this lung has a, a problem or not, okay, pneumonia or cancer, for instance, or if this flower is healthy or not, or which flower is it, okay? So, um, um, so, so those, uh, those embeddings allow us to uh, transfer learning from any model with, for any object, any modality, and, and most of these models are available in repositories like image to vec and TensorFlow Hub, and of course, Hugging Face, uh, for free. They are open source, not all of them. So OpenAI, uh, GPT-4 isn't, isn't uh, open sourced, uh, but, but uh, it's, it, you, you have to pay for it. It doesn't cost so much money, but you can even use it for free using Hugging Face uh, with open source. Uh, models and Hugging Face is the largest one. It has today 150,000 or more uh, models that you can use, and you can see how to use the model, get the latest version of it, uh, understand which data set it was trained on, if there are any interesting problems to the data set, if there is bias. All of this uh, information is on this uh, repository. So there is a huge ecosystem that enables this democratization of those deep learning uh, capabilities, including generative AI. Now, embeddings are also used for vector similarity search. So how is that, what, what do we mean? Let's say we have a word puppy, and we generate an embedding for it using one of those models, one of those large language models. Maybe it's GPT, maybe it's BERT, maybe it's LAMA, okay, or alpaca. And we generate an embedding, a series of numbers. It doesn't mean much to us. We don't know what 0 0.6 stands for, you know, is it, what is it? Is it a, an animal? It means if it's animal or an object, what, what does it mean? We don't know. Uh, and, uh, but what we do know is that, uh, and by the way, you can do it with just one or two lines of code. So this is really huge, you know, imagine $20 million or half a million dollar of investment, and you can just take it for your own use with using one or two lines of code, generate or embedding those magical things. Uh, what, what the property that it has that we can uh, take advantage of is that vectors uh, are closer to each other if they represent similar objects in the real life. Okay, so similar objects in real life are closer to each other in the vector space. So if a puppy and a dog are more similar than a puppy of a house, then the distance between puppy and the dog, the vectors, will be much, much uh, closer. And uh, this uh, is really uh, something that we can uh, take advantage for vector similarity search. So vector, vector similarity search allows us to, to inject AI into applications. Uh, for instance, instead of just doing a simple keyword search, we can do semantic search. It really understands what we are doing, and not just for Google, for our own website. Q&A bots. So we may have 10,000 of questions and answers for, for a support. We, when, a, when a customer uh, enters a question, we look for the question that is most similar, similar to the question, and we give the answer. Using vector similarity search, we do it. Matching agent for dating and job application, sentiment analysis for, for let's say, Twitter tweets, recommendation, ad recommendation, content recommendation, product recommendation. So find me the top three most similar products, products to my query, and this is find me the top three most similar products is a KNN query, K nearest neighbor, okay? So what are the three, K equals three, so three most similar nearest neighbors product to my query. And on the other hand, there are use cases like fraud detection, deduplication, content moderation, and anomaly detection that we do the opposite. We find the most similar and we want to remove, avoid, stop, okay? So we find two products that are very similar, it's a duplication, we remove one of them. And all of this has to be done in split second, because if it's a, have an e-commerce site and somebody is doing 
a search and I want to recommend the product is not going to wait even a second. So it has to be done in a split second. And this led to a new paradigm of database, the databases that deal natively with embeddings, okay? Uh, so if in the pre-internet era, we had rash, rational, relational database for tabular data, rigid schema, asset transaction, you know, for ATM transaction, financial transaction, then in the cloud and big data era, we, had, we have still no SQL databases that are excellent with unstructured data, schemaless, operations like map reduce, uh, scale horizontally, you know, with the internet scale. And, and most recently, you know, in the past two, three years, it's more and more important that they will be very, very fast. And vector databases, they can store very efficiently, index and perform a vector similarity on embeddings, on those vector representations, those learned vector representations. And, and they can, they they can do uh, it's very important to perform well at scale and and uh, uh, not just the speed but the accuracy because otherwise the the accuracy of the prediction or um, or the recommendation or the scoring would be poor so this is uh, the vector databases for the ai era now uh, if if we look at at actual use cases you know deployed in production so ku which is a very successful friendly social network uh, from India, use uh, uh, vector databases for vector similarity search for content moderation. If a user uploads an image that is, uh, is bad and it's too, sim or it's too similar to another image, to a bank of images that are, are bad or one of them, then uh, it is not allowed to upload this image. This is content moderation. Q&A bot by Gitbook, you know, the technical documentation platform, what I explained before. This isn't chat GPT. It doesn't generate new answers. The answers are in the database, but it finds the most similar question to the query and provides the answer. A personalization engine for super linked for recommendation. Perception points, threat prevention platform, use vector similarity search for threat detection. And WooCommerce, e-commerce website platform, uh, based on uh, open source, uh, use it for hybrid search, semantic and lexical search. So combining semantic search, what is the meaning of my search with keyword search, a hybrid search. Now, up until now, I talked about um, vector databases and vector similarity search, uh, regardless of generative AI. Let's see how they solve uh, the issues that we discussed before. So hallucination, you know, just inventing uh, things that are misleading or untrue or completely not accurate. What, we've, what was found out that if you feed the model with relevant facts and data, it sticks to the script, okay? It doesn't have to invent things. It, the model doesn't feel uh, comfortable uh, saying, I don't know. So it just invents an answer. This is like a very intuitive, not very accurate explanation. But if you feed the model with the relevant facts and data, it doesn't hallucinate or it reduces very much the problem of hallucination. Trend on all data, provide an, a knowledge augmentation, feed the model with fresh and real-time data with vector databases. Limited input lengths, again, no problem. You, you, can, you have infinite amount of uh, space theoretically uh, by using efficient indexing with, for vector similarity search in uh, vector databases. So you can, as, as many documents that you want, even billion embeddings, uh, it's okay. Now, I will, I will go back to this point. Um, the, the input length is getting uh, bigger. Uh, just recently, Claude came out with 100K, 100,000 uh, tokens, which is equivalent to 75,000 words, which is a lot. Uh, but, but still, even if it, it would have accommodated 1 million tokens, okay, or 10 million, still the most efficient way of, uh, um, of giving the relevant context for the LLM, for ChatGPT-like app, is using a vector database. This is, uh, um, and I'll explain more about that. And of course, uh, 70,000 words is great, but it's not enough. You know, if you think of what you, what's, how many documents your organization have, or 10K documents or financial documents, um, or any, anything else that's you know, worth searching over than a product, you know, your product catalog to be more than 70,000 words. Limited chat memory, again, unlimited chat memory, 
access to my proprietary data, data that I don't want, definitely in the public domain or in any other company. Customize LLM with your own data, PDFs, emails, Slack messages. No reference are provided, no problem. The snippets that you find, the most relevant snippets or chunks of data that you find in the vector similarity search, let's say the, the five most uh, relevant, these are the sources because based on, this is what you fed to the LLM. Based on that, the LLM or the ChatGPT made a response. So these are the sources and you can give those sources together with the data, like the page number, the article name, uh, etc. Produce harmful or toxic content. Okay, so again, if you feed the model with relevant facts and data, it will produce less harmful and toxic content because, you know, it sticks to the script. Uh, and there are other ways of using vector database to reduce, uh, to, pro to produce a less harmful, uh, you know, to, to address the problem of producing harmful and to toxic content. And I'll, uh, if we have time, I'll uh, speak about it towards the end. So vector database can provide the memory, the knowledge base, the, the knowledge augmentation, and the embedding search, you know, this very efficient embedding search, it's not just brute force uh, um, checking against every single document because it's indexed. We can also do a, a approximate nearest neighbor uh, with very sophisticated algorithm that make it much, much faster and more efficient without compromising uh, a lot on accuracy. Um, okay, so how does it work? Essentially, we have three steps um, to, um, to um, integrate um, the knowledge in vector databases into LLMs for our use case. So first of all, we need to load the database, right? We have to uh, load the database with all the documents that we think are relevant. Maybe it's the whole, all the, the whole product catalog. Maybe it's uh, uh, all the 10K documents uh, generated by a certain industry, okay? Maybe it's all the Slack messages and email messages in your organization. So we need to generate embeddings to that data and load and ingest to the vector database. The second step is generate an embedding for a question and then query the vector database to guess the most relevant context. We also, when, when we use the chat GPT to generate a query, we need, we need to, uh, to, to input the query. We need to generate an embedding for that query. And then we need to input the question with the relevant context that we got to the LLM, uh, to the LLM and get the answer. So this is how it goes. We have the documents, as I said, maybe it's PDFs, maybe it's email, Slack messages, product catalog. We split it into chunks, digestible chunks. Uh, maybe, maybe it's paragraph. We generate embedding for each chunk through a, a machine learning mo a, a model, you know, like a foundation model. We load, index, and store in the vector database those vector embeddings, the metadata, and sometimes even the documents themselves. Then we need to, we have a question, okay? Uh, I would like to buy blah, blah, something, okay? We generate embedding to that question using, using the same um, uh, model. And then we perform a KNN, a similarity search, or ANN, which is approximate nearest neighbor, against the, dat the data that we loaded to the vector database to get the relevant context and chunks, as you can see here. Now we input those chunks, okay, which end the question, the original question that we had to the LLM and to get, and we get an answer. Now, what about references or resources? No problem. We can refer back to the chunks that we just uh, uh, input to the LLM as the reference, including the metadata. Uh, this is the paper, this is email from this date, this is the paper from uh, by Stanford from that date, whatever uh, the data that we have in the vector database. Now, uh, what about using larger input context? So as I said, Claude had, uh, has uh, 100K tokens and there was some debate about that. So um, my answer is that, you know, there are trade-offs. There is cost, there is latency. You will need much more hardware uh, um, to process a 100K uh, prompt than to do a vector similarity search and just give you know the most the most relevant paragraphs for the query okay so it, you either need more hardware or the api which if, if you if it's if it's, it will be more hardware if it's uh, open source on your own hardware or in aws let's say 
in the cloud. Uh, it will cost more if you're using, a, let's say, an AP, API from OpenAI. Uh, and it's, the result will be more accurate if you use vector similarity sets because you fed the most relevant chunks, okay, the most relevant segments of data. Um, and as I said, 70,000 words is still not nearly enough for many, many, many use cases. So for most use cases, indexing the data with vector database and running a query against it is the fastest and most cost efficient method. So, so it doesn't matter if, um, if the price will go down even further, it won't go down uh, uh, to, to, there is a limit how much it will go down, right? It's not gonna be for free to be above the cost. And as long as the cost, this is the, the inefficient way cost more then then it won't be the one that will prevail. Of course, it's huge, you know, having 100K tokens, but it's not instead of a vector database. Okay, so example for when vector database is actually used as memory and knowledge base for LLM frameworks and to LLM large language models. So here I put a few of the you know popular um, models, so uh, frameworks and tools, Langchain, which is very very popular, Llama Index, uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT memory. All of them are using vector database for knowledge augmentation, and in the case of ChatGPT for the chat memory okay and uh, they have they're already uh, pre-integrated with the leading uh, vector databases and they are adding more and more vector databases and just uh, yesterday i saw stack ai which is a platform okay like a middle layer platform a no code platform for building llm applications and they say look a uh, cloud is huge uh, that uh, has 100k tokens but it's still the most efficient way that we recommend is using vector database because otherwise we'll call it will cost you one dollar per api call and this doesn't really scale you know uh, LLM uh, plus vector database example for user facing apps okay so this is even though it's uh, early days uh, there are already cool things out there so auto gpt which is very popular ai agent for autonomous autonomous task completion i think it has over a hundred thousand uh, stars already in github um, Bloop, which is maybe the earliest, navigating large code base, so uh, help with reading code, find code and get explanation, record everything in natural language. Uh, AppSumo, uh, so they created a chatbot for AppSumo called AskSumo for the app marketplace for entrepreneurs. And Ask Seneca, which is a cool project, a conversation with Seneca, ancient Rome philosopher, okay? So let's see how they perform. So the best way is, you know, is just try them out. What are some, I asked, ask Sumo, what are some of the alternatives to Zoom for running webinars? So it's a very successful platform for entrepreneurs and, and, and they have a marketplace for apps. And the answer, this is the answer that I got. It's a good answer. I, I, I was very happy. And the only problem was that it, it, it took too long uh, to process. So. I'm, you know, patient. I waited uh, as long as it takes, but people are not going to st stick around for a minute even. So this is early days. We're just happy to see something like this, but I'm sure that the, over time this would be, have to be much, much faster. Bloop. What happens if a user starts syncing repos and quits the app halfway through the sync? So, so the sync. So you know, this is really cool. You get an answer in natural language. It read through the whole code. It could be, you know, if you're a new employee or if you have huge legacy code, this is really very, very useful. And you can ask follow-up questions on anything here and get answers. So this is really nice. Bloop. I asked Seneca, I asked Seneca, ancient philosopher, should I buy a Mazda or a Tesla? So I got a very nice answer, including resources. You see the one, two, three, four, five are the resources. And it integrated the philosophy of Seneca, you know, telling me not to focus on material possessions, etc. And I asked also GPT, which is, you know, the most uh, popular, you know, it's over 100,000 stars in GitHub, create a cyber version of Elon Musk image. And, you know, it's, it broke it down into tasks and subtasks and did everything. It's amazing. It can connect to the internet and manipulate files and, you know, very exciting. And this was the result. I wasn't very happy about it. So what have I, what I have to say? Mind-blowing potential, but for mission-critical application, a lot more work around LLM ops is a must. 
So what is LLM Ops? It's, it's LLM operations, like MLOps, but for large language models. And, um, it, and what is it? I, I, as I said before, it's applying DevOps principle to ML and LLM. So it's not just about uh, integrating vector database and embeddings, you know, using embeddings and vector databases, vector similarity search uh, to integrate proprietary data. You need to also address all the other issues. Uh, and uh, there is a, a really great blog that uh, Chip Oyon uh, wrote, Building LLM Applications for Production, which I recommend to read. It also touches about, about the point of vector databases, but also other a very interesting aspect of LLM, unique aspects, and how can they be addressed? And as I said, we're still in early days and, and, and a lot of more work has to be done. So what are uh, what is the ecosystem that can help me bring uh, th these applications faster to production? So for neural search uh, or vector search, vector similarity search, which is Another way of injection AI into your application. This is uh, 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 the ecosystem pyramid. Uh, it's adapted from Dimitri Khan blog where vector search is taking us. And it, on the bottom, uh, there are the KNN ANN algorithms, approximate nearest neighbor. Instead of comparing against every vector, uh, you, you have much more efficient algorithms, approximate nearest neighbor. The vector databases, uh, a lot of them are open source. Um, the neural frameworks, this is adapted from uh, Dimitri, so I made some changes. Neural frameworks on top that leverage vector databases and the KNN algorithms like Haystack, Gina AI, Relevance AI, Victera, Hebia, some of them with you know uh, low code and no code options. Embedding models, which I think are the most important because they are the, like the, the magic. Without them, none of it would be possible. Embedding models repositories that host the embedding models. So this is a uh, one pyramid. Now, how do you choose, choose a vector database? How do you choose uh, an algorithm? So uh, for a lot of these, there are benchmarks and there are, you know, uh, and there are, there are uh, blogs that compare the options, but these are some of the key considerations that I listed. So if you look at the recording, you can, you know, you can look about, after about it, but there are many, many uh, considerations to take into. And um, some of, one of the most important things is the, the performance, as I said earlier. And there are benchmarks for uh, that uh, provide uh, to you, uh, you know, comparison between leading uh, vector database uh, for you know for this use case or not. Or not this, there are many benchmarks. This is one by Gina AI benchmark vector search database with one million data. One million sounds a lot, but a vector database can can scale to billions as well. And in this particular uh, benchmark, you can see accuracy uh, on the one hand versus uh, performance. Here it's queries per second, and higher is better, and Redis performs the best. And for your particular use case, it might look different. You have to really run those use cases yourself. And this is the ecosystem or the LLM pyramid for, um, um, for um, um, you know, for ChatGPT like uh, apps, how to, if you want to bring those applications faster uh, uh, to production. So uh, at the bottom, I put the LLM models. So it could be G G GPT-4, AWS, Titan Text, uh, Cloud, that I mentioned there, Cohere, AI21 Labs. Uh, but in uh, Bolded, I have all the open source one. And uh, I think that always uh, I would... Uh, always want to consider the open source ones uh, because it's, uh, if they are, sometimes they are good enough and they are getting better and better in, in, at an amazing speed. Uh, all, j many of these were just launched in the past few weeks, okay? Uh, about half of these open source models are good also for commercial, uh, uh, commercial use cases, not just for research uh, and, uh, or in, uh, experimentation. So I think this is really huge and it's so exciting to see the work that is done by the open source community and the co collaboration and cooperation. And that, it's not just the open source community, you know, it's all started with Llama, uh, with uh, Facebook uh, shared uh, Llama, but without the weights, without uh, which, which it's the way you have to train, you know, invest this, you know, millions of dollars to train the model. But then 
the weights were leaked or released. And following that, there were many, many, many uh, innovations because of that. So it's not just uh, open source companies, it's also commercial companies that are uh, uh, launching those open source options. And uh, just to show the respect, the open source community, every time they create a better version, they, they always recognize the contribution of the previous model, even by calling it uh, with very similar names, you know, like, or Dolly uh, for, um, you know, the clone of the sheep. And so we have Lama and Alpaca and Kuala and Vicuna and, and you know, it's amazing. So, uh, and then we have the vector databases, which is very similar to what I, I showed earlier. We have the LLM frameworks, which is different from the newer frameworks like Langchain and Lama Index and, and, and more. And maybe on top, I would say platforms like, like uh, Stack AI, uh, which is no code platforms. Then we have the embedding models, as I said, are very, very important. And the embedding models don't have to be state of the art LLM. Um, they just have to uh, be able to capture um, the, you know, what the semantic meaning of the object, so the similar, so the similarity would would apply. And we have the model repositories, so OpenAI, Hugging Face, Cohere, Bedrock uh, for AWS. Okay, so this is the uh, ecosystem for uh, LLM uh, pyramid, uh, and uh, just an additional synergy. So we have uh, the LLM. We fine tune it for instruction or dialogue. Maybe we also fine tune it with RLHF, which is um, a, a reinforcement learning uh, with human feedback. Now there are recent uh, papers that show that this isn't so critical to get maybe to get the best performance. Yes, but but it's pretty uh, much good enough. And you have the uh, input uh, monitoring uh, uh, screening and output monitoring screening, sc uh, screen, uh, censorship. Now, you might say that also the input monitoring screening and the output monitoring uh, censorship should be done through fine tuning. Okay, so we have an edit foundation model. We fine tune it with more and more and more. I would say that a lot of it can be offloaded to a vector similarity search. So. If you want to know if a, a query is age appropriate, you can have a list of uh, inappropriate uh, queries for specific age and just not allow them. And if there is content or responses or outputs that are not appropriate for an age, again, you run a vector. So it doesn't make sense that you'll have to train a, 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 an LLM, you know, for a user who is 13 year old, a user who is a five year old, a user who is 20, a user who lives in Asia, a user who lives in uh, in uh, in the US, um, it has a, or a different role and admin. So I think that uh, that what we'll see, we'll see uh, a lot of uh, these things offloaded, um, and maybe even to a third party services like a Kata, uh, that that they will do uh, some of those uh, uh, screening or censorship for safety, in the same way that they they check for a uh, fraud or uh, for threat detection using vector similarity search, they will uh, do it uh, to uh, censor the outputs of a model. Like think of a chat GPT as a potential spammer, okay? Uh, so, so most of the emails you receive are good, but some of them are spam. Okay, so, so in the same way that vector similarity helps us with uh, detecting fraud and stuff, the same way it can do uh, with monitoring and censorship. So this is my two cents here. And I think that we might see it evolving in this direction. So uh, the future is really here. And uh, the innovation, you know, is it could be around, and I showed you some of the examples already in production, like ChatGPT like for, uh, for, for internal productivity, you know, in Slack, it could be for a product catalog, uh, like, like, you know, uh, chatting about the product. It could be for customer support. So I think this is this is this is a table stake or using vector similarity search to improve the search. This is everyone will have to do that. But you can think beyond that. What what other innovation it enables us? So free your mind. So here are some ideas. Ethic tool for history by interviewing historical figures. Ask Abraham Lincoln. What a better way learning for kids about an era when you can ask Abraham Lincoln all kinds of questions. And this is something that maybe we can um, train a chat a GPT to be a, a lawyer. It doesn't have to be a lawyer and a doctor, just a lawyer, maybe just a patent lawyer um, the, uh, to train 
for a specific job description and instead of having manpower we'll have a power and maybe this sounds like a bit creepy you know but this is gonna happen so we might as well be on top of it okay we might as well be the people who are training the models that are gonna replace us and that means that we have a different job the same way that a calculator replaced a woman who were very good in mathematics and they did the calculations so calculator replaced them uh, sorry computers they were not calculators computers replaced a role called computer that did mathematical calculations very advanced you know space and stuff but these some of these uh, computers those women uh, became the first programmers of mainframe okay so we can be those first pro uh, programmers of mainframe uh, instead of just being replaced and this is uh, something also an idea create a Joel type AI like Superman was able to talk to his dad after he died using an AI that captured the personality the image of that person so this also sounds creepy but I think we are going to see such innovation uh, in this direction as well most of the building blocks for creating innovation creating innovation uh, new business startups already exist and most of them are open source uh, so my final words here are innovate or be disrupted. So in, in, in order not to be disrupted, we have to innovate fast. And this means not just creating cool demos, but also deploying them to production, uh, you know, so users uh, will be happy with them. Um, so that uh, concludes my presentation. Uh, let's see if we have uh, uh, questions. Second. Thank you very much uh, for listening, first of all. Yeah, Thank you for that, Nava. Uh, guys, if you have questions, there's a Q&A tab. Be sure to hop in there, type them out, and I'll let Nava know of any that come through. Uh, really insightful discussion, Nava. Definitely a, a big talking point in society as a whole right now, right? Like ChatGPT really put the Eureka uh, in our minds, and that really kind of lit a fire underneath us, right? Like, I think the very big thing that's going around right now is Evolve will get left behind. Um, the, I think the comparison I always hear at the moment is it's like back when we switched from people working in the fields constantly to like industrializing it, right? Bringing in tractors and different machines. It's that kind of level of innovation. Um, one thing I, I thought would be good to open up on the questions with is, you know, you're talking a lot, a lot about LLM integration, right? And there's, there's been a lot of examples of that working or not working so far. Um, what are some examples you can think of where it resulted in a big failure because of the way they tried to integrate the system that you think in hindsight could have easily been avoided. Again, can you repeat the last part uh, of the question? Yeah, so so looking at some, look at a bunch of the examples of LLM integration, which maybe hasn't been you know, successful. Uh, are there some clear examples that stand out to you that could have easily been avoidable? You mean how to avoid unsuccessful LLM integrations? That's yes, yeah. Some, some examples that have happened that you, you looked at and you went, they could have easily avoided this problem. So, you know, maybe maybe um, one one thing is that um, you could you see that that uh, some of the outputs of LLM uh, are, are very, uh, you know, very long outputs. And I think that uh, this this creates a, a huge latency a, a lot of times. So on one hand, you want to feed, you know, the customer with all the data that you have, but limiting the, the output uh, would be uh, probably better. First of all, the customer will appreciate it because, you know, uh, he, he asked the question, he doesn't want to read the uh, books and it will be much faster. So the, the, late, the latency here uh, would be uh, lower. And uh, we know from search, uh, abandon, abandonment search, search abandonment that uh, e-commerce sites people search and they don't find what they have they just leave so i think that if it takes too long for a chat gpt like app to to answer then uh, we'll see the same kind of abandonment uh, so i think that this is uh, one option i think that uh, facebook uh, mentioned that uh, their uh, chat gpt like uh, wasn't isn't that successful because it's too boring they made it too safe so I think that you have to also be careful with that. Not not all users appreciate censorship, you know. Um, so this is uh, only also one thing that uh, to consider. I, I think there's like a, an interesting element in the censorship and the trust element, right? With a lot of these things, like a lot of people aren't very trustworthy of these systems right now. 
Um, I think one example that, that maybe worries people is, you know, you talked about this idea of tra training AI to do different things, like, you know, being a historical figure to tell you the past. And I guess like a big thing that people have a difficulty wrapping their head around is this whole idea of those systems could start off genuine and authentic, but is there much to stop people further down the line altering their behaviors, right? So they can become more predatory, for example. Yeah, yeah. So this could be like like model drift. You know, we can see, we see it also in the, in regular machine learning models that suddenly there is a drift. So there has to be you know the same. And this is you know I I talked about how vector databases help, but L, MLOps should be applied to LLM in the same way that they apply to any application. So monitoring, you know, thinking about security, privacy, all those things have to be uh, you. you think about but i think that what we see mostly is very cautious um, behavior like um, maybe you know checked you know they also have a chat gpt like implementation uh, the company that crashed maybe they were supposed to launch a month earlier or two months earlier and we see a lot of implementations for internal uh, uh, chatbots you know because he's safe you know, employee isn't going to sue me or something, hopefully, you know, but, uh, but I think that uh, we should go out there, we should, uh, this is the only way, uh, and, and, you know, you should put a warning, and as I saw another option is to trend the model, not to give a straight uh, answer, but to say, these are the pros and cons, and these are the alternatives, so, so it can't go wrong, you know, maybe one of the points of pros is wrong, but on the general, the answer is, is uh, it's it's better than to give a deterministic recommendation, which is completely false. You know, and we, and we see it. I think we all experience that, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's where people freak out. They hear about things like um, lawyer AI is a perfect example, right? And it's like, well, that has to do with imperatives, whereas what you're suggesting is, you know, you, that you can be right or you can be wrong. Like the in between is really just bringing the suggestions in, right? It's what the people yeah. do with it. At the end of the day, yeah. you know, with all these fears around AI, you know, there are certain things that AI will be able to do better than us, but there's always going to be processes that at the end of the, the road require human input, right? And maybe yeah. the, the correct approach is to use AI as um, an advisor, right? Your concierge, if you will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think that the, the sources, the fact that with vector databases, you can provide the sources. It's a huge thing because you can look at the source and decide for yourself. This is what's great about Google search. You get the results and then you look and say, ah, I don't believe this this guy, you know, the, this blog. Or yeah. I don't, you, you know, you can give it your own weight. And uh, so I think the, the bringing the source would help. So basically, vector database help a lot with a lot of those challenges, but many still exist. And uh, I think also maybe one point, uh, if you, if you remember the Mechanical Turk from maybe 20 years ago, Mechanical Turk, which is used by Amazon for uh, HIT, Human uh, Intelligent Task, as an API call. So the same way that, uh, that, that Mechanical Turk regulated and made sure that the results are consistent and accurate could be used for, uh, for LLMs. So doing an average, you know, like having multiple answers and take it average for a score, you know, for a credit card score, loan score, a grade score of an essay, you know, and you just to generate, you don't even have to pay another employee. So or an, another HIT uh, yeah. from Mechanical Turk. Yeah, oh, that's fair. Uh, Nava, I, I would love to pick your brain more on this. I'm sure there are people that want to pick your brain as well. Um, folks, if you do have any questions for Nava, you know, you can contact her there, connect her on LinkedIn. She seems more than willing to answer any questions you have. Another, it's been an absolute pleasure, but I've got a rush. We've got another talk starting in just a moment. Hopefully, I'll hear more from you in the future, though. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. This is all we got. Dreaming about a revolution in our minds. This is all we got. Lock me out of this life institution I am angry and I am illusions Yes, I hate but it's not a solution Try my best, buddy, I'm just a human